Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on metabolism. In this video, what we're going to do is follow up on our discussion of glycolysis, uh, and we're going to discuss uh, the citric acid cycle. Okay, uh, so we will be starting with uh, pyruvate. So we're not going to re-go over glycolysis. Uh, we're going to start with the end product of glycolysis and see where it goes uh, after that. So we're going to follow the story on. Okay, now it's worth saying uh, that the citric acid cycle has other names uh, which are used. Okay, so you will also hear the citric acid cycle, also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Okay, and for short, the tricarboxylic acid cycle can be uh, abbreviated the TCA cycle, so carboxylic uh, acid. Okay, so carboxylic acid. Uh, that doesn't look right for some reason. I think it's right. Carboxylic acid. Uh, and then it's cycle. So tricarboxylic acid can be abbreviated to TCA. Right. Uh, and it's also got another name. It's also called the Krebs cycle, after Hans Krebs, uh, who was uh, major in um, working this pathway out. Okay, so whatever you want to call it, the citric acid cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, uh, we're going to study it. Okay, and it's the process by which um, you break down what is left, basically. You take pyruvate, and basically what you're going to do is break it down just into carbon dioxide molecules. Okay, so let's start off with the structure of pyruvate, which is our product from glycolysis. Okay, so remember, uh, pyruvate is a free carbon molecule, like so, um, and you have a carboxylic acid group, and also in the middle of the second carbon, you then have a carbonyl group, so a double bond to an oxygen. So this is the structure of pyruvate. Now, strictly speaking, this is not the structure of pyruvate. This is, in fact, the structure of pyruvic acid, okay? Uh, because pyruvate, strictly speaking, is the conjugate base of pyruvic acid. So it means this molecule with the proton lost off this alcohol group of the carboxylic acid group. However, of course, if you actually make a solution of pyruvic acid, you will, uh, what will happen is, is, suppose, let's do an imaginary thought experiment. So suppose you actually did put a huge number of pyruvic acid molecules into a solution. The instant you left them and let nature do its thing, what would happen is some of them would deprotonate, basically, and you'd instantly, therefore, end up with a mixture of both pyruvic acid and pyruvate molecules. Okay, so whenever you actually have one, you also have the other, basically, which is why people use the two names interchangeably. Okay, so within the cytoplasm of the cell, we have pyruvic acid molecules. Now, glycolysis, the entire glycolytic pathway, occurs within the cytoplasm of the cell, uh, but the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle, is going to occur within the matrix of the mitochondria. So let's just have a little discussion of the structure of a mitochondria. Okay, so let me draw a little mitochondria here. So mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And the inner membrane is folded in a weird shape so that you have these invaginations, basically, inwards, known as cristae, like so. Okay, so this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and then the outer membrane is this outer one here. And the space in between them is known as the intermembrane space. So this is the outer membrane, and then we have the inner membrane. Okay, uh, now, basically, the outer membrane is quite easy to cross, okay? So it's got great big holes in it. It's got huge pores uh, through which things can move. Uh, so it's not particularly tight. So pyruvic acid molecules or pyruvate molecules, which are in the cytoplasm, will easily be able to get across uh, the outer membrane into this intermembrane space here, which is the name for that gap between the two uh, membranes. Now, I just want to make something very, very clear, okay? These 
this inner membrane and this outer membrane, those are two separate phospholipid bilayers. Okay, so this inner membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. This outer membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Do not think that these are the two leaflets of one phospholipid bilayer. Some people do think that what has happened here is basically, if I draw the structure of a normal uh, lipid bilayer here, so normally, uh, as a cartoon, people draw phospholipids like so. The head is represented by this ball, and then the two long-chain carboxylic acids are represented by these lines, like so. Okay, so you have two layers of um, phospholipids which are um, oriented in the opposite directions so that the hydrophobic tails face one another to create this hydrophobic core. Some people think that what this means is that you've pulled apart the two layers and the intermembrane space is this gap between the two of them. That is not right. Both of these membranes, basically, are uh, phospholipid bilayers. So this outer membrane is one complete one of these. This inner membrane is a complete one of these. And then you've got a space in between the two. It's not that you've pulled the two uh, leaflets of a phospholipid bilayer apart uh, and expanded the space in between them. That's not right. Okay, so don't let that uh, be one of your confusions. So this is the intermembrane space here. Uh, right, so pyruvic acid molecules will diffuse from the cytoplasm into the intermembrane space. However, the inner membrane of the mitochondria is extremely tight. Okay, and the pyruvic acid molecules need to get into the matrix of the mitochondria, which is this space within the inner membrane, basically. And I'll just finish my diagrams. These invaginations of the inner membrane inwards, these are known as cristae. Okay, and since I've just put the arrow to one, I'll use the singular, which is a crista. Okay, so the plural, so if I now direct the arrow to two of them, would be cristae. Just like formulae is the plural for formula, okay? Right, uh, so, um, basically, the pyruvic acid molecules need to get into the matrix of the mitochondria because all of the enzymes for the uh, citric acid cycle are within uh, the matrix of the mitochondria. However, they cannot get across uh, the inner membrane of the mitochondria because it's very, very tight. And it has to be because later, when we discuss the electron transport chain, we'll see that this tightness is essential for um, the electron transport chain to be work, basically. You have to build up a proton grating to cross this membrane, and you don't want the protons being able to get uh, across uh, just freely, basically. They have to go through uh, the ATP synthase enzyme, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so at the moment, we need to talk about how pyruvic acid is going to get across the inner membrane of the mitochondria into the matrix. Okay, now, this is quite clever. Basically, we're going to kill two birds with one stone because there is a reaction. We want to turn pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA molecules, okay? And basically, as we move the pyruvic acid across from the intermembrane space into the matrix, we are going to also catalyze a reaction, basically. So we're not just going to move it. Whilst we move it, we're actually going to catalyze a reaction. Okay, so... Basically, there is a huge complex of proteins in uh, the inner membrane of the mitochondria, so here in pink. And this complex is known as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So in pink, this is the pyruvate and then dehydrogenase, um, and then it's complex. Some people will just call this the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme, but strictly speaking, it's many different proteins all working together. And the pyruvate dehydrogenase is often abbreviated to PDH. So this is pyruvate dehydrogenase, and then we should add complex, or the PDH complex. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen is you're going to bring well, basically, this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is going to bring the pyruvic acid molecules from the intermembrane space into the matrix of the mitochondria. And when it does that, it's also going to catalyze a reaction. So let me show you the reaction that it's going to catalyze. Okay, so we start with pyruvic acid up here. And basically, what you're also going to bring in is a new player. So before we just discuss this reaction, we need to discuss a new player. So we're going to bring in something known as coenzyme A. 
Okay, now coenzyme A is it's not a small molecule, but neither is it a massive great protein. It's a smallish molecule, an intermediate sized molecule. You could draw out its structure on a piece of paper, and uh, it's not a nice structure to have to draw out. It's big, but it's not massive. You know, you can draw it out on a piece of paper. However, we're not going to do that. For our purposes, there's only one important bit to the structure of coenzyme A that's going to be important for us, and that is that it has a file group. So we're going to abbreviate the rest of the coenzyme A molecule to CoA, like so. And then we're going to just show the file group coming off CoA, like so. So this is a special group here, this sulfur atom bound to the hydrogen atom, like so. This is what's known as a file group. Okay, and I would encourage you to think of a file group as being similar to an alcohol group. Okay, so sulfur atoms are in the same group of the periodic table as oxygen atoms. So they have similar chemical properties to oxygen atoms. Now if that was an oxygen atom there rather than a sulfur atom, you would call this an alcohol group. We have got a sulfur atom there, however, but it has similar chemical properties to oxygen. Therefore, this group has similar chemical properties to the alcohol group, and it's called a file group. Okay, so the file group is all that's important for us as far as coenzyme A is concerned. So, basically, we're going to bring in one of these coenzyme A molecules. So, I will put this in up here. So, we'll have CoA and then we've got a file group coming off CoA. Alright, this is going to come in. It's going to be part of this reaction. Okay, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to, what you can imagine doing at least for the basis of understanding this reaction, and again, I should stress that I'm not in this video going to show you electronic flow diagrams. I'm not going to show you how the electrons actually move in these reactions. What I'm going to do is explain how uh, the reaction makes sense, how what's on one side adds up to what's on the other side, basically. So, you can imagine splitting this bond between uh, this first carbon of the pyruvic acid molecule and the second carbon of the pyruvic acid molecule. Now, in covalent bonds there are two electrons, one from the two members of the bond, basically. So this carbon will have stuck in an electron, this other carbon will have stuck in an electron. Imagine sending one electron back to this carbon and the other back to this carbon. Of course, that isn't what will actually happen. Homolytic fission is quite rare, you know, it occurs, well, it's not quite rare in nature, it occurs all the time, but, you know, it leads to free radical chain reactions, such as combustion is the example I'm thinking of, a free radical chain reaction where it would happen. Okay, but um, it's not going to happen here. We're not going to get free radicals being formed. Okay, but for the basis of understanding this, it's helpful to think in terms of homolytic fission. Okay, so this isn't what happens. This is how to make sense of the reaction. Okay, so also imagine splitting this atom between, well, this bond between the sulfur atom and the hydrogen atom. Okay, so there will be two electrons in this bond. Give one electron back to the sulfur atom and one back to the hydrogen atom. Then bind this sulfur atom to this carbon atom here. And you can do that because both of them have free electrons. Okay, and what will you now create? We've now got this two carbon carboxylic acid molecule here, like so, uh, with the um, coenzyme A molecule attached to it like so. Okay, now the old name for uh, a two carbon carboxylic acid molecule was acetic acid or, or acetate. Okay, so the group that you get from an acetic acid molecule attached like this uh, is what you call an acetyl group. Okay, so basically it's the acyl group of acetic acid. So let me just explain that a little bit more. So basically, if we just have a two carbon carboxylic acid here, and I'm showing, I will always show, I always prefer showing uh, the protonated form, but of course you will have the non-protonated form as well. Uh, this molecule that I've shown is acetic acid, and the non-protonated form, the conjugate base, is then acetate. Okay, so acetic acid and acetate will be used, uh, you know, as one basically, you use them interchangeably. Okay, now, 
we do not have an acetic acid molecule here. Instead, we just have this portion here. We have an acetic acid molecule where the alcohol group has been removed, basically. And that is known as the acetyl group. So that's what acetyl means. We have an acetyl group, and it is attached to coenzyme A. So this is called acetyl coenzyme A. And for short, coenzyme A is called CoA. So this is acetyl CoA. Okay, right. So there is one of our products. That's our main product. Now let's just discuss what we're going to do with the rest of this mess here. So what we're going to do is also imagine splitting the bond between that oxygen and that hydrogen there. Okay, so give one electron back to the oxygen, one back to the hydrogen. Okay, and now this oxygen has a free electron. This carbon here still has a free electron from the breaking of this bond. So bind this oxygen to this carbon with another bond, and what you'll create, therefore, is a molecule of carbon dioxide. So when you've got carbon bound to two oxygens, where both of the bonds are double bonds like that, that's carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay, and we've also created, because this isn't finished yet, there is still mess here that hasn't been resolved. We have a hydrogen atom here. This is not just a proton. This is a proton with the electron. Remember, I imagine that I've given it the electron uh, that it contributed originally to this covalent bond. So this is a hydrogen atom. Also, here, where we broke the coenzyme A, uh, we broke this bond and imagined giving the electron back to the hydrogen. So we have two hydrogen atoms here, two protons and two electrons. And basically, what you do is you give them to a special molecule known as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It can accept hydrogen atoms, basically. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide will accept these two hydrogen atoms. And when, when it has accepted two hydrogen atoms, the way that this is denoted is NADH. Okay? Now, do not let that notation confuse you. Um, I may only have put one hydrogen there, but this means NAD with two hydrogens, basically. Okay? So don't let it confuse you. This is reduced NAD, which has two hydrogen atoms. Okay, so let me just write out the full name for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So the N is for nicotinamide, uh, the A is for adenine, okay, and then the D is for dinucleotide. Okay, so that's NAD. Whoops, what am I doing here? Nucleoxide, nucleotide. So let me get rid of that. Okay, so nucleotide. Okay, so, uh, basically, you would read this NAD plus as oxidized NAD, or oxidized nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And you would read the NADH as reduced nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay, and what the difference is between them is that this one has two hydrogen atoms attached to it. Okay, right. So, this first reaction that we have just looked at uh, is sometimes known as the link reaction. It's usually included as part of the citric acid cycle. It's never included as part of glycolysis. Occasionally, people count it as its own reaction. And when they count it as the own reaction, they call it the link reaction. But usually, you will see the link reaction just considered as part of the uh, citric acid cycle. However, it doesn't actually fit into the cycle, which is why sometimes it's considered as its own reaction. So it's not part of the cycle. Acetyl-CoA is now going to feed into the cycle. Okay, so just to review what's happened, the pyruvic acid molecules have come into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. What's then happened is this enzyme complex, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, has catalyzed this reaction where pyruvate uh, plus the coenzyme A molecule plus a molecule of oxidized NAD goes to a molecule of acetyl coenzyme A with carbon dioxide. And this is the first place where we've actually seen carbon dioxide being produced, basically, which, of course, it should be because we know respiration produces carbon dioxide. And finally, a molecule of reduced NAD, which is what we're going to use later in the electron transport chain to make um, ATP. Okay, so... Um, when it does this, the pyruvic acid will be on the intermembrane space, and then the acetyl coenzyme A that you produce will end up 
in the matrix, basically. So now, what we've overall got is acetyl coenzyme A in the matrix of the mitochondria. And we'll take it from there in the next video, and we'll look at the beginning of the citric acid cycle.